Hey everyone, I'm Malini Agarwal, also known as Miss Malini, and I'm the founder of Miss Malini Entertainment and co-founder of Good Creator Co. I'm the host of this first ever podcast, The Good Show, by The Good Creator Co. And as most of you already know, we're India's largest creator ecosystem, dabbling in influencer marketing, influencer commerce, influencer sampling, regional marketing, and so much more. And for the unaware, all you need to know is that we recently bagged Influencer Marketing Agency of the Year Award 2022. So applause for us. <laughs> so in The Good Show, we will be presenting everything that you need to know about the influencer marketing industry ecosystem and straight from the experts. And today we present Mahir Gandad, Associate Director, Influencer Commerce at The Good Creator Co. Thank you so much for being my very first guest, Mahir. How are you today? I am doing great, Malini. How are you? I'm very good. Let me start by asking you a question. How do you feel about this entire content creator ecosystem? And did you ever imagine that this would become an industry of its own? Uh, sure, Marini. First, let me thank, take a moment and thank you for inviting me as the first speaker for the series. Truly honored. Uh, Low-key fanboy moment for me to chat with you as well. Uh, coming back to your question, what I think about creator economy. Well, uh, creator economy is one of the most trending buzzword and why shouldn't it be? Brands are ensuring that influencer campaigns are part of their marketing mix as it helps them reach audience in the most candid way. Plus, the recommendation is coming right from the horse's mouth. So while as a marketer, you really want to increase the share of voice for your brand. But if that is coupled through the most trending uh, social media platforms, I think it just kind of puts the cherry on the cake. Absolutely. So, so yeah. I think what's interesting is, so I've been doing this for 14 years. And when I started out, it was like a hobby blog. And uh, I had no idea and could, couldn't possibly have predicted where this industry would go today. And uh, you've been doing this for some time now, you know, in the influencer marketing space as well. Um, how how long has it been for you? And, and what has the experience been like? Yeah, so I have been in the space for close to three, three odd years. Um, I was part of an influencer uh, platform called Bulbul, which we are where we used to sell products through influencers. So something uh, right up my alley. But thanks to creators like you who have uh, given us opportunities for brands like us to kind of come forward and leverage you and uh, uh, help your distribution kind of pro uh, broadcast it ahead. I think it's really interesting because when I started out, I remember people were really um, wary of content creators or influencers. That wasn't even a word selling something right they always yeah. felt that this felt that made people very uncomfortable that how can you be a content like how can you be writing a blog and selling me something and i've seen this evolution uh yeah. into influencer marketing and commerce becoming a real industry over time but i think for everyone who's listening who may not know these terms let's just take a step back and maybe define this for them you know what does influencer commerce influencer marketing really mean Sure. So there is a very thin line between influencer commerce and influencer marketing. So when your campaigns are performance linked, meaning that they do not just stop at the usual metrics of views, but yeah. helps brand go one level deeper to track the traffic, conversions to their website, it kind of makes the entire campaign more measurable as against influencer marketing. So, so yeah, I think uh, I hope that answers the question. And so when if for all the brands that are listening in, because they're the ones who are also trying to sort of decode this. And I've seen over the years and, uh, you know, of course, one of my business partners, Mike Melly, has really been so uh, instrumental in breaking down these barriers about influencer marketing and digital marketing and getting people to put money in online. But I know the biggest problem that brands would always face was how do I measure my ROI? How do I know that this is going to be successful? Um, you know, somebody might have X amount of followers, but does it make a difference? And even for content creators, we often wonder, you know, what is the metric that really matters? You can tell the brands it's number of followers, but you and I both know that not, it's not necessarily the only metric that matters. You know, because you might be selling a luxury car. You can't sell it to someone with millions of followers because that's not the audience buying that product. So um, when a brand is making this choice, what should they be keeping in mind between influencer con for, uh, you know, commerce and marketing? Sure. So a uh, couple of things, in fact. So uh, I think having the right creator mix. Uh, should I go all guns blazing and do it with mega and macro creators? Or maybe identify some niche micro creators or nano creators? Uh, and nowadays, there are a lot of tools that have come to the market that give you access in terms of engagement metrics, channel analytics, etc. So identifying the right creator cohort is something which I would recommend as number one point keeping in mind while executing a campaign. Yeah. Second, uh, 
since we are making it more performance linked uh brand should identify the right products that need to be pushed through this channel see uh, not all products uh, sell uh through influencer channel your product needs to have that differentiation which is why i always recommend to do non commoditized products versus commoditized products uh, so for example uh, a creator can only add too much value for promoting a face wash versus an under eye cream which is a differentiated product in itself just mm. an example uh talking about tracking how do i ensure end to end tracking i think there are a lot of uh lot i mean there is there's enough and more technology out there to help you track end to end right from the views to the traffic that is going from the youtube video or instagram uh, uh story to your website how many people are actually transacting on the website and then what is the revenue that is being generated so essentially as a brand i need to justify whatever investment i am getting what are the returns against us mm -hmm. so for different industry different brand it might it, it differs basis the uh, their their multiple eye factor so and do you think that when it comes to the you know the return on investment the roi the brands are looking for should they expect that this should lead to sales or is it enough that it's having some kind of marketing impact and what should uh, you know content creators be looking to promise them okay so interesting question so i think uh, as a marketer i think there are there are two ways to look at it one is a branding exercise one is a sales focused exercise so for a branding let's say a uh, uh, brand x is launching a new product line maybe initially they want to uh, propagate their or broadcast how they can take it to the market so maybe there we may not look at metrics of revenue or or returns however uh, returns in absolute numbers however uh, when you talk about the usual top selling products of your uh, category or portfolio if i'm using the, those products in the videos then maybe i might link those to performance how can i track it then i will possibly look at metrics beyond views clicks traffic how am i better converting those users yeah i also thought it's interesting that with social media there's also this other layer right you can get a brand sentiment you can also add you know those coupon codes on those links and all of that and i was used to wonder how people measure traditional media otherwise you know a billboard or a magazine or a tv ad and what the the hike is so it's really interesting to see that yes. comparative but so can you also help us understand the process behind influencer marketing campaigns there's so many layers to it that i think that uh, you know the average audience may not even be aware of or some brand that's getting into it and actually an interesting thing happened i was on a flight to goa recently and somebody overheard me and some influencers were traveling and he asked an interesting question he said so you know you guys know that you are you know your influencers but how would i if i'm trying to promote a healthcare change know who to go to and uh, he said can i just google a list of influencers and i thought that was such an interesting question because we live in this industry and we live and breathe it so we know which are the big influencers what is legitimate but for the new brands coming along how should they go about finding their influencers very relevant question something which is uh, bread and butter for me in fact yeah. so so it's actually more like a playbook uh, firstly we need to understand what is the campaign objective is it branding is it sales so basis is that you decide the platform do i want to explore instagram do i want to explore youtube because both the platforms are very different in terms of their friendliness towards commerce so once we have identified all these uh, your team internally needs to study what are the products that you want to push what are the competitors doing what certain past videos that your competition has been doing once you have identified who your real tg is you then identify the cohort of creators that have the highest overlap in terms of the kind of brands that they are doing what you should i always recommend brands to read comments because i think the real moat is in the comments so you get a lot of insights uh, if i if, if you end up reading comments mm -hmm. and and then of course once we have all these three four recipes uh, it's it's essentially a recipe so so the recommendation is then given in terms of what product themes will work well in a video and a directional estimate on uh, what is the output in terms of the traffic and potential output uh, to their website yeah Yeah. So, I always so thought it's so interesting yeah. that uh, you know like a billboard is a great sort of showcase that this is a new brand that's here. And uh, then you have a celebrity endorsement that really, you know, makes sure that every eyeball gets to see it. And then the content creator is someone which feels a little more like 
a lifelike recommendation of someone whose opinion you trust. And sure. then you now have this whole world of micro and nano creators, which is something that we focus on, obviously, you know, in the Good Creator Co ecosystem, which is much more, I think, granular. And I think it, you know, you, I feel like sometimes you're more likely to trust a micro creator's recommendation if they're specialized in a certain topic, uh, even over a celebrity, because you you know that celebrities are you know, promoting something for yeah, yeah. money, uh, but you know right. that this, this yeah. is probably coming as a genuine uh, recommendation and also because you feel like you know this person. I think that's where the creator... Relate to it, yeah. That's you right. can really, really relate to it, which I think is really interesting. So uh, can you also walk us through any one campaign that almost failed? Because I feel like that's where you really learn, you know, and you, you learn from those experiences and, and how did, you know, you improve the experience or what did you do to sort of firefight and what was your takeaway from that? Okay, so uh, very recently, I remember uh, we were doing a campaign with Sirona for their uh, menstrual cups and face razor, and uh, they wanted to uh, divert the traffic to their website. So with 50% of the campaign being delivered, we were not getting the desired results. And there was a complete firefighting that was going to what's happening and we were not able to understand the actual scenario. Uh, however, we realized that Sirona has a very strong presence on Amazon in terms of ratings, especially for their menstrual cup range products. So what we did is a very simple hack. We simply took a screenshot of the product page of menstrual cups, which had over 35,000 plus ratings, yeah. four plus uh, stars on Amazon and asked creators to use that in the videos. Mm -hmm. Now, this small hack literally doubled the uh, traffic that was coming on Amazon that naturally translated into the sales. So I think you need to look at these small hints, small, you need to study the brand, you need to understand where is it more relevant. And and why? Because, hey, because uh, Amazon as a platform, again, it uh, it's, it's creators have, uh, users have a high trust and people are more familiar to the platform. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, midway, gladly we realized that uh, uh, it was better to change the call to action to Amazon and uh, and all in all, it was a win-win situation eventually. But yeah, you have to look at those hints. You have to look at those hints. Absolutely. And I think that's a really good, good takeaway for me is that if something is not working, you have an opportunity in a digital universe to make a change. It's not like, that's okay, right. that has been printed or the billboard is up and um, now we can't do anything about it. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, also would love to know from you, is there a need in your opinion to customize campaigns for different brands if they're different sizes and niches or is there sort of a template that fits all? No, no, absolutely. Uh, it is not a one size fits all approach. I mean, because uh, every brand A is different from brand B is different from brand C. Yeah. So we study the brand, their target groups, what is their average order value? Uh, because I'm uh, not all creators of different types will be able to drive, like you mentioned, for most, I mean, a nano creator may not be able to sell a luxury product, etc., as against a mega or a macro creator. Uh, you need to study the competition category. So the creator, the creator cohort differs from brand to brand. That's why you. Uh, this also ensures freshness in the campaign. Yeah. So absolutely, it differs from uh, brand to brand. And you've seen, of course, so many creator campaigns. What do you feel that the creators need to learn? What can they do differently? Some of the mistakes that you've come across that you think that they could, you know, use a fresh approach. Interesting. So uh, while we highly encourage creators to bring their creativity on the table uh, because they know the audience well, but at times the de desired output is far from the scope of the brand. So this kind of increases back and forth. So if if we want, we highly encourage creators to kind of uh, have a have a box. You think of it as a box, but again, uh, this is a recommendation we generally give key, uh, that to stay in the script. Right. I think uh, you may not, uh, you may or may not uh, attest to it. However, uh, in addition, we also recommend creators to try the products and give that authentic review because right. this looks more organic coming from their own personal experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, quality of content is going very high with the advent of short form apps and you need to cover everything in the in, in 15 seconds or 20 seconds. So I think uh, having the right camera angle, sound, lighting, possibly these are the hygiene factors, but uh, these are essentially very necessary for the desired output that is required to the brand. Absolutely. I think the, the most important thing here, which I also agree with, is being authentic because the reason why anyone is using a content creator over a more generic way of marketing is your unique voice. 
And mm. like you said, you you can stay within a script, but unless you know uh, your own feelings about the product, it'll never sound real. Okay. And I find that even for myself, if I'm doing something in a rush and just reading a script, I know in my heart that I don't sound as real and authentic as if I'm giving my genuine Absolutely. review or my genuine opinion on it. And I think that also comes with, um, you know, as creators, there's so much pressure to perform and get your campaigns out. It sometimes means that less is more, you know, you know, pick the campaigns and the brands that fit you. I admire all the creators who do such a great job of integrating the brands into their original narrative, you know, so you have a Kusha Kapila or a Shishti Paj or Mosi Sain or Masum, and they all do such a good job of keeping their authentic voice and talking about brands so seamlessly and they make it look easy, but it actually takes a lot of work. Um so now that I mentioned this topic, I would love to know, do you think influencer commerce is primarily effective only for fashion and beauty brands or it has more of an impact? Uh, no, absolutely not. I think it can be leveraged by any and every commerce brand. It's just that the uh, nature of these categories, fashion and beauty is attributed to fast consumption. So yes. you see more of it. Uh, but however, back at Bulbul, uh, during my previous en engagement, uh, we used to sell products ranging from bed sheets to kitchen appliances to small gadgets through influencers. So I think um, the sky is the limit. If you have a checkout option on your uh, website, you can activate uh, influencer commerce. I also think it's interesting that there's so many new kinds of influencers that are cropping up, you know, beauty and fashion entertainment are there. But now you see doctors and lawyers and, you know, all sorts of different creators and they are using social media to obviously represent themselves. And but now I'm seeing, you know, this orthopedist that I follow, um, you know, selling products as well because they also have a legitimate voice. So I think that's really interesting because the range of products is now going to go up because you have new voices and testimonials for it. So, uh -huh. I mean, just like it was many years ago, uh, mm -hmm. there are going to be content creators in the future that don't exist today for uh -huh. needs that don't exist today. I mean, I think we also realized this with the pandemic, right? There was such a big change in our lifestyles that suddenly you had uh, hosts of Zoom conversations, and that became something that you know exactly. we needed before. Um, and how it's do you also see the need of the R two power? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think they say it's a very common uh, saying that change is the only constant. So I yeah. think you have to move with the absolutely. The, uh, Times, yeah. yeah, and so so now that we're on this topic, how do you see technology shaping up in the creator economy for brands and creators? So much is happening. I always talk about you know um, you know the, the advent of three D and virtual reality. What do you think is next for us? Interesting. That's a very interesting question. So for uh, for brands, for example, uh, the lot they proactively using AR filters on Instagram, Snapchat. I've, I I rightly remember my glam had created a lipstick look. Yes. So you just there is an Instagram filter and the lipstick gets applied. You can actually understand see the shade of it, and that's a great way because uh, you're doing it where a the creators are there and the audience is there. So I think it maps uh, maps correctly. Uh, Instagram, for that matter, has rolled out payment feature in the US, where users can directly purchase products from small businesses uh, from through through DMs and thereby closing an entire e-commerce loop on the social media itself. So right. I think that's a solid feature that Instagram has rolled out. Uh, on the creator aspect, I think a lot of these creatives, creators have started monetizing their followers with the advent of affiliate channels, um, shout outs, etc. So creators are also finding secondary alternate sources of income. Uh, another bud was uh, in the creator of economy is the web 3.0. Yes. Although I have limited knowledge about this, but uh, I'm sure the early adopters of NFT, etc. I'm sure uh, they will only benefit from this because uh, five years back, we didn't know how uh, three years back, we didn't know how reels would take up. But yes. today it's, it's the talk of the town. So so you never know how what can click. And I think the early adopters uh, uh will win in this web 3.0 and nfts so, yeah. absolutely i think there were definitely a, a podcast episode on uh nfts in our future definitely for that and just one last piece of advice for brands with limited budgets because there's a lot of small businesses that are out mm -hmm. there homegrown businesses uh can they use influencer commerce or is that not the best place for them to put their money no, no, they can absolutely use influencer commerce. I mean, so again, the budget is a very subjective term. Uh, we work with brands who have a budget of 5,000 and the ones who have budget of 50 lakhs as well. So so even a single video on YouTube is enough to kickstart a performance linked video where you can track end to end. So I think uh, there are no 
or very less entry barriers to enter into and explore influencer or commerce as a channel and i think the great thing is for every small brand there are small influencers that will fit so that's just exactly. exactly i also love that big creators do genuinely uh, recommend products that they really do love that might be small businesses so there's a great opportunity there uh, as a creator myself i can tell you a lot of times people will send me samples and if i really like something i will write about it so that is a good exercise to to okay. engage in uh, so before we conclude our insightful session here's something i would definitely love to know tell me about some brands content that you absolutely loved and that performed well more importantly interest so um bliss club for that matter i think i find their content very really cool uh, interesting product clear usp not a user but from the outside i love it uh because i mean it is it has a very differentiated uh uh i mean who thought of having pockets uh yeah. to your yoga pants yeah. i think so and and the content they are creating around it from social on all social media platforms instagram youtube etc i think uh they have hit the nail hard uh so i think i i like biscuits content a lot and so i would be a mistake for me meher not to ask you this question now that i have you trapped in this zoom box what is something that brands should be asking you when they are looking for influencer commerce or marketing what is the question that they should be asking to get the right results what are the returns on my investment yeah what are the returns absolutely right yeah, and yeah. make sure you are clear on what you want and what you're getting and that's a match because then you will be happy the brands will be happy the creators will be uh clear on what they're supposed to deliver thank you so much meher this was amazing our very first episode i hope you enjoyed our chat i found it very insightful uh lots of takeaways from here and i hope everyone who's listening likes comments subscribes and tunes in for the next one any parting words from you meher uh i thoroughly enjoyed uh this was my first podcast uh i'm only taking good memories from here and i hope to catch up with you soon thanks mommy and thank you the good show bringing miss mani back on the air after a very long time but feels like very comfortable space for me stay tuned because here we're going to discuss everything to do with the creator ecosystem and influence of marketing and all the questions that you have don't forget to leave us a comment and maybe suggest a guest that you would love to hear there will be creators there will be marketeers and everyone from our entire ecosystem uh make sure you follow the good creator co on instagram for more updates as well and thanks for listening bye everyone